one of the greatest critics of Mao has been Enver Hoxha. Famously, he wrote Imperialism and Revolution, Mao Zedong Thought, and Anti-Marxist Theory as a refutation of Mao's theory and practice. This document has been repeated ad nauseum without a critical eye by Hojas who seek to prove their revolutionary cred by simply screaming revisionist at everything the loudest. It should be obvious that such actions are antithetical to Marxism as a science of revolution. Yet, despite this, Hojas throw unending accusations and make unprincipled attacks upon Mao based merely upon Hojas' work. From this we can clearly see the attitude held by many Hojas, an attitude that I call the two whatevers of Hojaism. Whatever Stalin said was right, whatever a Marxist of color says is wrong. I think this adequately describes the mentality of Hojas and their inability to be critical of Hojas' writings. In this video, I will tackle most of the common attacks upon Maoism that are leveled by Hoxha. In it, I will show how terribly dishonest Hoxha actually was towards the theoretical contributions of Mao. In many cases, he deliberately misquotes Mao in order to misrepresent what he is saying. Such is the in lack of integrity of Hoxha. Doing so will shed light on much of the racist attitudes that modern-day Hojas display towards Marxists of color. This work will focus on the theories presented by Mao and the actions he took. It is not important what character flaws Mao may or may not have had. The personality of leaders is not important. The theories they present and the actions they have taken are. To d distract into personal attacks against historical figures in Marxism is nothing less than the tactics of anti-communists in their despicable dishonest writings. Having said this, let us proceed into Hoge's work. We'll begin with Hoja's assault upon Mao's idea of the peasants being the revolutionary force of China, as opposed to the industrial working class. Mao analyzed the concrete conditions of China. The result of his analysis was that the identification of the peasants as being the proletariat of the country instead of the industrial working class. Around 80% of the population of China was consigned to being peasants upon the land. The working class, by contrast, was incredibly small. The most basic Marxist teachings tell us to reach the masses. In China, this was the peasantry, not the workers. This was a great point of division between Mao and Wang Ming, who bitterly opposed Mao on this idea. He, like Hoja, accused Mao of a peasant mentality by suggesting that the countryside should encircle the cities. As we could see from the events that took place, Hoja and Wang were wrong. Yet, interestingly, Hoja had the benefit of hindsight but still, he insisted that Mao was wrong. Mao Zedong expressed the petty bourgeois theory, not recognizing the leading role of the proletariat, in his general thesis that the countryside must encircle the city. Revolutionary villages, he wrote, can encircle the cities, rural work should play the primary role in the Chinese revolutionary movement, and urban work on a secondary role. Mao expressed this idea when he wrote about the role of the peasantry in the state. He has said that all other political parties and forces must submit to the peasantry and its views. Millions of peasants will rise like a mighty storm, a force so swift and violent that no power, however great, will be able to hold it back, he writes. They will put to the test every revolutionary party and group, every revolutionary, so that they either accept their views or reject them. According to Mao, it turns out that the peasantry and not the working class should play the hegemonic role in revolution. How can it be wrong to work in the countryside when that's where the masses of people are. To insist upon the city-dwelling workers is to condemn the revolution to failure. And that's exactly what happened. Wang led a communist revolution in the city to the, with the industrial workers into a total catastrophe. This led to the rise of Mao's correct line and the necessity of the long march to avoid total destruction. He misquotes Mao on his report on an investigation into the peasant movement of Henan. Hoja claims that Mao said that the peasants should lead the party, not the party lead the peasants. Hoja quotes Mao saying, Every revolutionary party and every revolutionary comrade will be put to the test to be accepted or rejected as they decide. But he deliberately omits the following words. There are three alternatives. To march at their head and lead them. To trail behind them, gesticulating and criticizing. Or to stand in their way and oppose them. Every Chinese is free to choose, but the events will force you to make the choice quickly. As we can see, Hoja left out some very important context by misquoting Mao. Mao said that the peasants were a powerful force inside the Communist Party that, that, that they should learn should lead them towards communist revolution. This is not what Hoja falsely claims Mao was saying. 
It is strange to see Hoja contradict Stalin so openly as he agreed with Mao's assessment. I know that there are Kuomintangists and even Chinese communists who do not consider it possible to unleash revolution in the countryside, since they fear that if the peasantry were drawn to revolution, it would disrupt the united anti-imperialist front. That is a profound error, comrades. I think it, that it is high time to break down that inertness, that neutrality toward the peasantry. And the common turn was and still is of the opinion that the basis of the revolution in China in the peasant period 1927 is the agrarian peasant revolution. Hoja makes the allegation that Mao Zedong was never able to understand and explain correctly the close links between the bourgeois democratic revolution and the proletarian revolution, contrary to the Marxist-Leninist theory which has proved scientifically that, that there is no Chinese wall between the bourgeois democratic revolution and the socialist revolution, that these two revolutions do not have to be divided from each other by a long period of time. Mao Zedong asserted, the transformation of our revolution into socialist revolution is a matter of the future. As to when the trans transition will take place, it may take quite a long time. We should not hold forth about this transition until all the necessary political and economic conditions are present until it is advantageous and not detrimental to the overwhelming majority of our people. The question that should come to everyone's mind is, what did Hoja leave out with the ellipses, the three dots? Here's what Mao said with the italicized part being the part that Hoja removed. As to when the transition will take place, that will depend upon the presence of the necessary conditions, and it may take quite a long time. Mao is saying that the transition to the socialist revolution is inevitable and that the transition depends on the presence of necessary conditions. Hoja goes on to claim, Mao Zedong adhered to the anti-Marxist concept, which is not for the transformation of the bourgeois democratic revolution into socialist revolution during the whole period of the revolution, even after liberation. Thus, in 1940, Mao Zedong said the Chinese revolution must necessarily pass through the stage of new democracy and then the stage of socialism. Of these, the first stage will need a relatively long time. Now, here is the part that Hoja deleted, butchering Mao's quote and twisting it into something he didn't mean and cannot be accomplished overnight. We are not utopians and cannot divorce ourselves from the actual conditions confronting us. What Mao actually said was that the new democratic revolution leads into socialism once the necessary conditions have been met, which he specifically says is the elimination of imperialism and feudalism. What Hoja obfuscates is that Mao is speaking of two different stages with different alignments of class forces and has different tasks. Hoja deliberately ignores that Mao wrote extensively on the fact that the national bourgeoisie in China and in countries like it could not lead the bourgeois democratic revolution to victory. That because it was bullied by imperialism, this bourgeois had some contradictions with it. From time to time, it joined the ranks of the revolutionary struggle. But precisely because the national bourgeois was a weak and flabby class economically and politically, because it was still tied into a certain extent to the big comprador sections of the bourgeoisie and also the landed property, it would always vacillate at best and times capitulate to the forces of imperialism and domestic reaction. Now, Mao actually explains this in greater detail. Although the Chinese revolution in this first stage, with as many substages, is a new type of bourgeois democratic revolution and is not yet itself a proletarian socialist revolution in its social character, it has long been become a part of the proletarian socialist world revolution and is now even a very important part and a great ally of world revolution. The first step or stage in our revolution is definitely not and cannot be the establishment of a capitalist society under the dictatorship of the Chinese bourgeoisie, but will result in the establishment of a new democratic society under the joint dictatorship of all the revolutionary classes of China headed by the Chinese proletariat. The revolution will then be carried forward to the second stage in which a socialist society will be established in China. This is a fundamental characteristic of the Chinese revolution today, of the new revolutionary process of the past 20 years, counting from the May 4th movement of 1919 and its concrete living essence. Hoja opposed the idea of a people's war as a way of liberating the oppressed countries. He was equally dishonest with it as well. His primary allegation was that Mao claimed that the peasant should lead the revolution, or that the petty bourgeoisie should do it. 
The peasant class, the petty bourgeoisie, cannot lead the proletarian, the proletarian revolution. To think and preach the opposite means to be against Marxism-Leninism. Herein lies one of the main sources of anti-Marxist views of Mao Zedong, which have had a negative influence on the whole of the Chinese revolution. What is most striking about this allegation is the lack of any evidence that Mao supported this idea. Hoxha doesn't even try to butcher one of Mao's quotes into saying something that it doesn't. He can't find a single shred of evidence that Mao supported this position. Mao actually makes the opposite clear in many of his writings, which Hoxha leaves out. All he can really do is draw false conclusions from Mao's works. If Mao really believed that the party must work, that the party work must be concentrated in the countryside, and that the agrarian question was the principal internal contradiction that had to be solved by the democratic revolution, then Mao must have been saying that the peasants must lead the workers. What Mao actually said was, in the revolution in semi-colonial China, the peasant struggle must always fail if it does not have the leadership of the workers. But the revolution is never harmed if the peasant struggle outstrips the forces of the workers. And Verhoja knew what he was saying was false. For his own petty reasons, he lied about what Mao stood for in order to prop himself up as a theoretical successor to Stalin, while clearly contradicting that line from him. Further attack on Mao, Hoja attempts to portray him as a narrow nationalist and Chinese chauvinist. To do this, he attempts to make the case that Mao disobeyed the common turn over the basic line of the Chinese Revolution. In addition, he accused Mao of rejecting the idea that the Soviet Union was the fatherland of the world proletariat and was disrespectful to Stalin. This can only be accomplished by lying about what Mao has said. This can most easily be debunked with the following passage. China cannot possibly gain her independence without the assistance of the land of socialism and the international proletariat. That is, she cannot do without the help of the Soviet Union and the help which the proletariat of Japan, Britain, United States, France, Germany, Italy, other countries provide through the struggles against capitalism. Although no one can say that the victory of the Chinese Revolution must wait upon the victory of the revolution in all of these countries, or in one or two of them, there is no doubt that we cannot win without the added strength of their proletariat. In particular, Soviet assistance is absolutely indispensable for China's final victory in the war of resistance. Refuse Soviet assistance, and the revolution will fail. Mao did refuse the idea that the Chinese revolution should be an exact copy of the Soviet one, as dogmatists like Holger seem to think it should have been. But Mao did integrate the basic principles of Marxism-Leninism with the concrete conditions of the Chinese Revolution. This can be seen in se on several occasions. At the time of the 1924-27 revolution, the Comintern representatives in China, particularly Borodin, played a very bad role in the revolution, supporting the line of unity above all with the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek. As Mao said, Borodin didn't just didn't just go a little bit to the right of Chen Tu Xiu, and he was ready to do everything to please the bourgeoisie, even to the degree of disarming the workers, which he finally ordered. Although it must be said that Borodin went to the right of many actual positions officially held by the Comintern, this alone cannot explain his errors. Chiang Kai-shek has been made an honorary member of the Executive Committee of the Comintern, a position which he held well into 1927, after his nature was clear. Furthermore, Stalin himself held out unrealistic expectations that the Wuhan government of the KMT, which he incorrectly characterized as petty bourgeois, would continue the alliance with the communists after Chiang deserted the revolution. It's quite clear that the Comintern gave bad advice to the Chinese party, as it is openly admitted by everybody except Enver Hoxha. Borodin himself told Anna Louise Strong in 1939, I was wrong. I did not understand the Chinese Revolution. I made so many mistakes. Again, Hoxha deviates from what Stalin had set down. Here's an example. Stalin explaining clearly what was to be done, while Hoxha gave a muddled mess of a statement, again with a misquote of Mao. 
Notwithstanding the ideological progress of our party, there are still unfortunately leaders of a sort who sincerely believe that the revolution in China can be directed, so to speak, by telegraph, on the basis of the universally recognized general principle of the Comintern, disregarding the national peculiarities of China's economy, political system, culture, manners, and custom and traditions. What, in fact, distinguishes these leaders from real leaders is the fact that they will always have in their pockets two or three ready-made formulas suitable for all countries and obligatory under all conditions. The necessity of taking into account the nationally peculiar and nationally specific features of each country does not exist for them. They do not understand that the chief task of the leadership, now that the communist parties have grown and become mass parties, is to discover to grasp the nationally peculiar features of the movement in each country and to skillfully coordinate them with the common terms general principles in order to facilitate and make feasible the basic aims of the communist movement. Hence the attempts to stereotype the leadership for all countries, hence the attempts to man uh, mechanically to implant certain general formulas regardless of concrete conditions of the movement of different countries. Hence, the endless conflicts between formulas and the revolutionary movement in the different countries as the main outcome of the leadership of these pseudo-leaders. Now compare this with what Hoja said. In this period, Mao and his supporters launched a theoretical campaign under the slogan of struggle against dogmatism, ready-made patterns, foreign stereotypes, etc., and raised the problem of elaborating a national Marxism negating the universal character of Marxism-Leninism. Instead of Marxism-Leninism, he preached the Chinese way of treating problems in the Chinese style, lively and fresh, pleasant to the ears and eyes of the Chinese people. In this way, propagating the revisionist thesis that in each country Marxism should have its individual specific content. As we can see, Hoja completely negates the struggle against dogmatism that Stalin called for. His purpose is clear. He wants to impose the Albanian party's own stereotyped line on the entire international communist movement. Again, we will see what Mao was actually saying without Hoja misquoting him. The theory of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin is universally applicable. We should regard it not as dogma, but as a guide to action. Studying it is not merely a matter of learning terms and phrases, but of learning Marxism-Leninism as the essence of revolution. It is not just a matter of understanding the general laws derived by Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin from their extensive study of real life and revolutionary experience, but of their standpoint and method in examining and solving problems. Our party's mastery of Marxism-Leninism is now better than it used to be, but is still far from being extensive or deep. Ours is the task of leading a great nation of several hundred million in a great and unprecedented struggle for us. Therefore, the spreading and deepening of the study of Marxism Lenin presents a big problem demanding an early solution which is only possible through a concentrated effort. Being Marxists, communists are internationalists, but we can put Marxism into practice only when it is integrated with the specific characteristics of our country and acquires a definite national form. The great strength of Marxism-Leninism lies precisely in its integration with the concrete revolutionary practice of all countries. For the Chinese Communist Party, it is a matter of learning to apply the theory of Marxism-Leninism to the specific circumstances of China. For the Chinese Communists who are part of the great Chinese nation, flesh of its flesh and blood of its blood, any talk about Marxism and isolation from China's characteristics is merely Marxism in the abstract, Marxism in a vacuum. Hence, to apply Marxism concretely in China so that it must, in its every manifestation, has an indu indubitably Chinese character, i.e., to apply Marxism in the light of China's specific characteristics becomes a problem which is for the urge for the whole of the party to understand and solve. Foreign stereotypes must be abolished. There must be less singing of the empty abstract tunes and dogmatism must be laid to rest. They must be replaced by the fresh and lively Chinese style and spirit, which is common to the people of China love. To separate internationalist content from the national form, it's the practice of those who do not understand the first thing about internationalism. We, on the contrary, must link these two closely. In this matter, there are serious errors in our ranks which should be consciously overcome. 
Now we can see further the reckless dishonesty of Hoja on Mao. Mao is saying that Marxism-Leninism is universally applicable because it can and must be applied to the concrete conditions of each country. This is an aspect of Marxism-Leninism that Hoja seems yet to have discovered. We can also see from Hoja's hatchet job the deliberate effort to misrepresent what Mao is actually saying. Hoja claims Mao is propagating the revisionist thesis in each country that Marxism should have its individual specific content, but Mao says very clearly the content of Marxism and internationalism require a definite national form. Is Hoja incapable of understanding the difference between form and content, or does he choose to just lie and confuse matters? Hoja was also adamant that China never became a socialist country. Instead, he claims it remained stuck in the bourgeois democratic revolution phase. Essentially, he blames the so-called shared power with the national bourgeoisie. The transition from the bourgeois democratic revolution to the socialist revolution can be realized only when the proletariat re resolutely removes the bourgeoisie from power and expropriates it. As long as the working class in China has shared power with the bourgeoisie, as long as the bourgeoisie preserved its privileges, the state power that was established in China could not be the state power of the proletariat. Consequently, the Chinese revolution could not grow into the socialist revolution. The military victory of 1949 established the democratic revolution and made it complete. Mao believed that those who opposed feudalism and imperialism could not accept a society based on the needs of the worker-peasant alliance should be given rights in the new state. This included the national and middle bourgeois, which fit this description. They were to be under the dictatorship of the proletariat, not equal members in the ruling of the country. This perfectly keeps in line of the allies of the revolution that, will, he said, will vacillate between loyalty and reaction. Mao also gave a path for the socialist revolution even before the war was won. After the enemies with guns have been wiped out, there will still be enemies without guns. They're bound to struggle desperately against us. We must never regard these enemies lightly. On whom shall we rely in our struggle in the cities? Some muddle-headed comrades think that we should rely not on the working class, but on the masses of the poor. Some comrades who are even more muddle-headed think we should rely on the bourgeoisie. We must wholeheartedly rely on the working class, unite with the rest of the laboring masses, win over the intellectuals, and win over to our side as many as possible of the national bourgeois elements and their representatives who can cooperate with us or neutralize them, so that we can wage a determined struggle against the imperialists, the Kuomintang, and the bureaucrat capitalist class, and defeat the enemies step by step. Mao noted quite correctly that modern industry consisted of only 10% of the national economy, while agriculture and handicrafts comprised the other 90%. As a result, China had class relations that were unique to them that defied the experience of other revolutions. He said that while democratic revolution required the national bourgeois, it would be the creation of an industrial working class that would lead the revolution forward. China's modern industry, through the value of its, out, of its output amounts, to only about 10% of the total value of output of the national economy is extremely concentrated. The largest and most important part of the capital is concentrated in the hands of the imperialists and their lackeys, the Chinese bureaucrat capitalists. The confiscation of this capital and its transfer to the People's Republic, led by the proletariat, will enable the People's Republic to control the economic lifelines of the country and will enable the state-owned economy to become the leading sector of the entire national economy. This sector of the economy is socialist, not capitalist in character. Whoever overlooks this or belittles this point will commit right opportunist mistakes. Thus, Mao's orientation of moving the revolution forward to socialism is not merely shibola, as Hoja derisively calls it, but was based on the actual realities of China and backed up with a clear view of how to begin the process of Stalinist transformation, uh, the socialist transformation of the economy. At the same time, Mao recognized that this could not be accomplished in one stroke. There still remained the huge agricultural and handicraft sectors of the economy, which the capitalists still had some role to play and could not immediately be wiped out. He argued that in this period, all capitalist elements in the cities and the countryside are not harmful, but beneficial to the national economy should be allowed to exist and expand. 
This is not only unavoidable, but also economically necessary. But the existence and expansion of capitalism in China will not be unrestricted and uncurbed as in the capitalist countries. It will be restricted from several directions in the scope of its operation and by tax policy, market prices, and labor conditions. The policy of restricting private capitalism bound to meet with resistance in varying degrees and forms from the bourgeoisie, especially from the big owners of private enterprises, that is the big capitalists. Restriction versus opposition to restriction will be the main form of class struggle in the new democratic state during the transition to socialism. This is the policy which Hoja calls giving priority to the development of capitalism. If this is the case, then how does he reconcile criticism with support for Lenin's new economic policy? Even Hoja is quoted Lenin as saying, There is nothing dangerous to the proletarian state in this so long as the proletariat keeps political power firmly in its hands. So long as it keeps transport and big industry firmly in its own hands. Now, Hoja also adds, In fact, neither in 1949 nor in 1956, when Mao Zedong advocated these things, did the proletariat in China have political power or big industry in its own hands. Moreover, Lenin considered the NEP as a temporary measure which was imposed by the concrete conditions of Russia at the time, devastated by the long civil war, and not as a universal law of socialist construction. And the fact is that one year after the proclamation of the NEP, Lenin stressed that the retreat was over and launched a slogan to prepare for the offensive against private capital and economy. Whereas in China, the period of the preservation of capitalist production was envisioned to last almost eternally. According to Mao Zedong's view, the order established after liberation in China had to be a bourgeois democratic order, while the Communist Party of China had to appear to be in power, such as Mao Zedong thought. This is how dishonest Hoxha really is. Right after the revolution, the Communist Party seized transportation as well as key industries in society. The Communist Party played a leading role in the state. Any suggestion to the contrary is a baseless accusation from the imagination of Hoxha. He correctly quotes Lenin as the NEP as a temporary measure imposed by the concrete conditions of Russia. However, one must consider the material condition of China were not those of Russia during the revolution. It had been hindered by imperialism and feudalism, not to mention three decades of war. China was, in fact, far more backwards than Russia was, and so much for Hoxha's adherence to material conditions. It seems to go out the window when he wishes to slander Mao. Mao even spoke only about the need to abolish the national bourgeois when the time came. He bitterly opposed capitalist rotors like Lu Xiaoqi, who advocated a mixed socialist capitalist economy. When the development had reached a particular level, some capitalist elements were to be eliminated as they were no longer necessary. If they failed to do so, then those powers would consolidate and take power back. With the overthrow of the landlord class and the bureaucrat capitalist class, the contradiction between the working class and the national bourgeois has become the principal contradiction in China. Therefore, the national bourgeoisie should no longer be defined as an intermediate class. Chief among the transition, transition's accomplishments was the tremendous struggle in the countryside to transform agriculture from an individual owner-peasant economy into a socialist ownership. Mao led the peasantry in going beyond the primitive mutual aid teams that had been set up during the Civil War in the base areas after land reform was carried out and then spread throughout China in the victory of 1949. Mutual aid had elements of the socialist future in it, but did not fundamentally alter the old property relations, as it left private ownership of land intact. Mao fought to lead the peasants to form a higher-level cooperative and achieve basic collectivization and then quickly move to form a massive people's communes, which represented the basic form of socialist ownership of the countryside for a long period of time, until the development of the productive forces and the rise in the socialist consciousness of the peasants could possibly could make possibly a leap to state-owned farms with the peasants becoming wage workers. Along these same lines, Mao was very wary of a mistake made by the Soviets and avoided it with better policy. Rightists in the party said that the mechanization of farming should take place before the collectivization of it. They pointed to the experience of the Soviet Union to back up their position. The Soviets did the opposite of what Mao did. This allowed the Kulaks to take even more wealth and power in the countryside. Mao avoided the Chinese Kulaks by engaging in class struggle before the mechanization of farming. In the cities, those factories that had been operated on a state capitalist basis, which is pointed out earlier, was never the dominant factor in industry in the People's Republic, 
or on a joint state private basis were converted into state property. It is true that in many instances, the previous owners of these enterprises were given a fixed interest on the property seized from them. In fact, a form of exploitation of the workers labor. This was done for several reasons. First, because the particularities of the long democratic stage of the Chinese Revolution, many members of the national bourgeoisie had gone along with some sort of the transformations that had taken place. Even while setting out to overthrow and eliminate the bourgeois class, Mao saw certain tactical advantages in not treating every individual bourgeois as a die-hard enemy of the revolution. Second, the expertise of the bourgeoisie was still needed to operate certain factories and so on. This policy was not much different than Lenin's well-known policy of bribing some of the technicians and managers of the old capitalist class to function for the Soviet state, a policy which continued well into the 1930s, and one which represented a necessary compromise. The fact that the these interest payments continued for several years follow the socialist transformation of industry in China. It is used by Ho Jen and others to insist no genuine socialist transformation ever took place. This, however, is a gross distortion. Once the nationalization of the means of production previously in the hands of the national bourgeois took place, no, no one could no longer say that they were capitalist enterprises. These factories belonged to the people as a whole in the form of state ownership. Production levels and planning were based on the overall needs of society as set forth in the state plans, not by dictates of the market nor by the need to show a profit. The previous owners could not sell or otherwise transfer their former holdings, and the small amount of interest they received on their previous holdings could not be reinvested as capital. Similarly, even those in plants where the old owners were retained in one capacity or another, they no longer had the decisive say about working conditions, work rules, and so forth. The products of the workers' labor could not be appropriated privately. In short, there was no fundamental, fundamental capitalist relationship in industry.